Law Warrior Solaris, Part 1 Solaris 7 The name conjures up images of veteran mech warriors battling for fortune and glory, of sweating throngs of eager betters standing in line to wager their meagre earnings on the outcome, of noblemen and crime kingpins reaping sea bills along with fame, influence, and all their associated advantages. For centuries, the games of Solaris 7 have represented the hopes and dreams of generations, where fortunes are won and lost, and notoriety gained by the lucky few who survive. The roll call of immortal mech warriors who have fought there is almost endless. Cabal Hirsch, Marco Moliotti, Hans Moda, Billy Wolfson, Gray Norton, Justin Shang, the O'Bannon sisters, Amanda Hamilton. All these and more have sought, won, and lost glory in the deadly arenas of Solaris. Through all the years of strife, the endless slaughter of the succession wars, the raids and counter-raids of the interim periods, and more recently, the clan invasion that threatened to devour the Inner Sphere, Solaris Seven has remained an island where the violence of the successor states could be organised, channelled, and in some ways, controlled. Here, war is a game and warriors a commodity. All across the Inner Sphere, the teeming masses daily watch the Solaris fights, rooting for their favourites and wagering their sea bills. Thus has it been in the past, and thus, for as long as there is an Inner Sphere, will it remain. Overview Solaris 7 is the largest of the 12 planets in its system. Exploration of the systems of the worlds have found them unsuitable for habitation, though the fourth planet is the site of an extensive, though only marginally profitable mining operation. An Earth-sized, water-rich world, Solaris has only two major continents, Greyland and Equitus, only one of which is extensively inhabited. Roughly the size of North America on Terra, Greyland is a place of great shallow seas and wide, sluggish rivers. Vast stretches of taiga in the north give way to forests of conifer-like trees in the central region and open into grasslands in the south. The climate of central Greyland, the location of Solaris City, is damp and chill. A brief spring season brings a wan light for a few weeks before the rain closes in again. Were it not for the mech games, Solaris City would be a dismal place indeed. The rest of Greyland is comparatively pleasant. Many nobles maintain summer homes along the southern coast where rainfall is rare and the cool sea breeze moderates a warm climate. Some sections of central Greyland boast forests fast enough to support a profitable timber industry, but even in such communities the mech games are still the most important of industry. Solaris's other continent, Equitus, has considerably less arable land, populated with only a few coastal fishing and inland mining communities. Equitus is considered the planet's wild frontier. History Despite its prime location along the Steinamaric frontier, Solaris 7's history has been relatively peaceful. Originally a free world's planet, Solaris fell to the Lyrans during the First Succession War, then suffered heavily from free world's depredations throughout the Second Succession War. In 2928, a Maric raid severely damaged Solaris City's mech repair facilities, but four years later, Steiner forces roundly defeated a major free world's invasion in September 3002. Battle mech contests are the major industry upon which the entire planetary economy is based, and this has been so almost from the earliest period of Solaris history. Those corporate executives who first used Solaris 7 as a testing ground for new mechs could never have imagined that these trials would one day become gladiator-like contests of a nightmarish form. Early Years Solaris 7's gaming industry began inauspiciously enough. Originally colonised for industrialization purposes during the Star League era, its heavy industrial base made it ideal for battle mech production. It was natural that several mech producers should decide to use Solaris as the site for their major testing laboratories. The planet's rugged terrain provided excellent testing grounds and dry run sites for new mech designs. Vast mech bays were reinforced and strengthened to serve as live ammo test sites. It was only a matter of time before rival corporations, competing for valuable Star League military contracts, began to pit their prototypes against one another in order to impress government officials. The first military mech competition between competing designs took place in 2695. In that first conflict, Orgus Industries' fledgling Phoenix Hawk defeated rival Defiance Industries' Sentinel. Long in use by Harris Steiner, the Sentinel was now under consideration for purchase by the Star League Defense Forces. Though both mechs eventually found their way into the SLDF, the Phoenix Hawk's performance on Solaris gave it a definite edge. 
Viewed by a small, select audience of corporate executives and their guests, the fight proved so exciting that within a year, mech contests had become a regular entertainment feature, broadcast to the populace. The Solaris Games had begun. The popularity of these contests didn't escape notice by the rich and powerful. Battles between corporate teams were popular, so why not use the popularity to generate a profit? Private mech stables were born along with cash purses, Tradeo broadcasts, and the beginning of the modern betting system. In addition to corporate teams, mercenary units used Solaris for training purposes, honing their skills in fights against local mech warriors. Some warriors even found it possible to make their living on Solaris. Although the betting and purse system was informal, profits varied widely, many Innisphere promoters saw the potential to get rich quick. Changing Fortunes As the century drew to a close, the Star League had collapsed. General Kerensky had left the Innisphere with most of his Star League army in 2784, and the first of what became known as the Succession Wars would break out. When Liren forces seized many worlds near Solaris 7 in a series of lightning strikes, Solaris, never closely aligned to the Free Worlds to begin with, easily changed allegiance. Though it has remained in Liren hands ever since, the Commonwealth government has approved a kind of neutrality for Solaris, much like that of Switzerland on Old Terra. The battles for Terra, Kerensky's exodus and the terrors of the First Succession War had drawn many of the best mech warriors away from the games. When mercenaries could earn fortunes fighting real battles for the success awards, the comparatively small purses on Solaris and their contests looked less and less appealing. Within a decade of the exodus, the planet's prospects seemed no better than the abandoned shells of its mech arenas. Reconstruction The inexorable descent toward economic ruin began to reverse in 2795, when the surviving promoters came up with a last-ditch plan to save the planet. Seeing the chance for a new source of income, the Commonwealth government agreed to the unorthodox proposal. The promoter's plan was simple. Now that the Innisphere had split into its five successor houses, the plan was to duplicate the conflict of the wars in miniature on Solaris, with each house government building and maintaining its own arena, where champions could fight for the glory of their nation. In this way, some reasoned that the bitter conflicts of the succession wars could be redirected, and the aggression possibly subsumed in the brotherly spirit of competition. Of course, no such thing occurred. Although the leaders of the successor states seized upon the proposal with enthusiasm, the contests on Solara served only to widen the already irreconcilable differences between the powers of the Inner Sphere. By 2800, Solara 7 was once more the capital of mech contest. Zones around each stadium in Solara City began to take on the character of their corresponding successor house, with emigrants from each state maintaining the character of their respective sectors. The Lyrans quietly allowed this to continue, realising that encouraging emigration meant greater income. Though officially administered by the Commonwealth, Solaris became almost an independent world, with residents allowed to maintain citizenship in their respective states, but required to live in the appropriate sector or quarter of the city. Though treaties strictly forbade spying or nationalistic activity, the various house governments treated the law with merry disdain. By the middle of the 29th century, Solaris had become a hotbed of intelligence activity and other intrigue. The international nature of the world had its advantages. Like the equally neutral Switzerland on Old Terra, Solaris became a financial centre where residents of many other worlds of the Innisphere maintained numbered bank accounts. The planet's political position kept it safe from attack, with the aforementioned raids in 2928 and 3002 drawing widespread criticism and condemnation. Even Wolf's Dragoons, while known for their rejection of Innisphere tradition, left Solaris alone during their more famous mech raids into the neighbouring areas of Lear and Space in 3019. The Succession Wars While conflict smouldered in the Innisphere, flaring up periodically into the doomed, pointless struggles known as the Succession Wars, mech warriors, particularly mercenaries, continued to travel to Solaris for training and to pick up needed cash for repairs and parts. In the Fourth Succession War, Maximilian Lau, then Chancellor of the Capellan Confederation, believed that the propaganda value of House Lau's victories would be more valuable than any military victory in motivating his weary troops. On Solaris, however, Capellan warriors were not enthusiastic in their response to Maximilian Lau's desperate call for aid in fighting the war. By the time some of these same mech pilots might have become receptive to helping their beleaguered nation, the war had run its course, and House Lau had been defeated and disgraced. 
When Houses Davian and Steiner were joined in marriage between Hansa Davian and Melissa Steiner in 1328, many expected Solaris to change. Because it seemed that peace and a new Star League under Davian leadership was inevitable, many believed that the need for such wasteful violence as the Solaris games would decline. These people, however, were dead wrong. Not only did the games continue, but their fervour increased, with Lao fighters determined to avenge the humiliation of the Fourth Succession War. Even the two sectors of Black Hills and Silesia remained officially separate, although freedom of movement between them markedly improved. War and Peace Relations between House Marek and the Federated Commonwealth were strained during the War of 3039, making it look as though Solaris might once more become the target of concerted military action. As House Curita defended itself against Hansa Davian's final drive to destroy them, the Combine's coordinator, Takashi Curita, called upon his allies to attack the Federated Commonwealth to relieve the pressure on his forces. House Lao, still reeling from the destruction of the Fourth Succession War, could provide nothing save encouragement. House Marek also stood by, sending dire ultimatums and hinting at grim consequences should the Federated Commonwealth armies continue on their course. In one communique, Solaris was mentioned as a possible target of Free World's operations. The populace braced for the expected attack, then heaved a collective sigh of relief as the war wound to its bloody, inconclusive end. Though Davian won more worlds than lost, most considered the War of 3039 a defeat for the Federated Commonwealth forces. Solaris was once more spared the horror of war. Despite the violence of 3039 and the subsequent conflicts between the resurgent House Lao and some states of the periphery, by 3050, peace might have been on the horizon in the Inner Sphere. The technological advances of the past decades, combined with general war weariness, led many to believe that perhaps the incessant wars would finally end. In this optimistic climate, the games on Solaris became more popular than ever. Comstar stations linked virtually the entire Inner Sphere, and even the small percentage of revenues that the promoters received for this service made many rich beyond imagination. In this atmosphere of growing optimism, a movement began to ban live ammo mech fighting, to be replaced by simulated battles with training weaponry and damage mimicking sensors. Surprisingly, this movement began to win support, even amongst the mech warriors. In December of 3049, a bill went before the Solaris Civic Council proposing the appointment of a committee to investigate the possibilities of such a change. Coming of the Clans In human history, time seems to favour the pessimist, and so when the clans burst unexpectedly on the scene in early 3050, any hopes for peace in the Inner Sphere were shattered. Kerensky's descendants had returned, but they'd grown strange and violent, sweeping down upon the successor states with a fanatic intensity, slaying and conquering. In their wake, old alliances were shattered and new ones forged, and all those solid, reliable things that men and women would become to know and depend upon were swept away as if by flood. The apparently unbreakable alliance between Davian and Steiner was showing signs of strain, as some citizens of both houses still protested the Union. House Lau again awoke to thoughts of greatness and ultimate victory, the free Raselhag Republic, which had seemed the perfect counterweight against the power of House Curita, was gutted and brought to its knees. House Marek, largely untouched by the conflict, saw its fortunes rise. Driven together by conflict and catastrophe, houses Davian and Curita began to look at each other in a new light. Comstar, the ancient secret order of Blake, seemed on the verge of collapse. All these were tragedies for the Inner Sphere, but food and drink to the hungry promoters of Solaris. The fights raged on any thought of humanising them or reducing the bloodshed forgotten. Desperate, half convinced that the end was near, many people spent previously hoarded sea bills in an orgy of self-indulgence and debauchery. Much of this money found its way back to Solaris as men and women wagered fortunes, hoping against hope that a big win might buy escape or salvation from the clan's inexorable march toward terror. Trillions and more changed hands overnight. Paupers became princes in a day, then became paupers again. Blood flowed, mechs fought, and the arenas were always full. These were grand days for Solaris promoters and mech warriors alike. Always a microcosm and barometer of the Inner Sphere, Solaris seemed to have run out of control, with its teeming citizens finally acknowledging that the future held nothing but war and terror, and deciding to wager everything on one last fling. The Frenzy, as it came to be called, lasted well into 3052. When at last the Comguards halted the clan's advance, the people of the Inner Sphere began to hope once more that perhaps life may go on. 
Slowly, the frenetic pace of life on Solaris began to return to normal. Solaris Today In the wake of the clan invasion, the games continue. At first, many believed that the honour-driven clans people might look favourably on the games of Solaris, providing new blood to the game circuit. Far from admiring Solaris and its games, however, the clans apparently despised the notion of fighting for money or the idea of wagering on the outcome of combat. They see such activities as a filthy perversion of a noble profession, a twisted caricature of their famous bidding system by which commanders earned glory and status. Should the clan wars begin again, many believe that one of their first goals will be to destroy the world they consider a den of degeneracy and evil, Solaris. Meanwhile, the games go on. They can never end until the successor states have passed away and peace again reigns over the thousands of stars of the Inner Sphere. <laughs>